Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Finance Story, and I'm your host, Vishal Krishna. Today, we have with us a very important person. He's an author and a corporate leader who has, over the last four decades, been at the helm of finance in many companies. He has authored several books, which include Who Blunders and How, Who Cheats and How. Now, his latest book is titled it's called Corporate Frauds, Business Crimes, Now, Bigger, Broader, and Bolder. And he's going to be telling us much more about finance, which is shaping the world in a modern era and why the role of a CFO is even more important today and how CAs need to evolve. We have with us Mr. Robin Banerjee, the Managing Director of Caprian's India Limited, a listed company which is into manufacturing of PVC film. How are you, Robin? Good. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. No, it's great. And I've become a fan ever since I've read this book, Corporate Frauds, Business Crimes, Now Bigger, Broader, Bolder. But I want to set some context for uh, people who are listening to this, right? Uh, guys watching this, just, just listen to these things. 5% of the world's GDP goes away to corruption. 16% of the CFOs are willing to pay cash to retain businesses or you know, their interests in, within the business world. 70% of CXOs bend rules to achieve targets. Habitual lying to raise money and building an image is, is the order of the day. There are Ponzi schemes, banking deceits, Cyber crimes have become common now. Why do you say that business crimes are getting bigger and bolder now? The best way to explain why corporate frauds are becoming bigger, broader, and bolder are two stories. If I say it is becoming bigger, broader, we'll say, hey, hello, I don't think so. People are getting jailed. I don't read that much as much. But is it so? It is becoming worse? Yes, it is becoming worse. Let me take you a story pertaining to India. Recently, about two years back, we have all heard of a fraud called the Nirav Modi fraud. And if you are, if you were either in India or abroad, you would have heard this diamond called the Nirav Modi diamond. It was being worn by not only Ken Winsley, one of the biggest and the best Bollywood film star, it was also being worn by Priyanka Chopra, ex Miss World, and and the harbinger of fashion, perhaps, in the modern world. Now, what did Nirav Modi do? Nirav Modi stole 11,000 crores, $1.6 billion over seven years from a banking system. Now, over seven years, you could, one person could steal $1.6 billion from the banking system by creating and getting letters of credits without any surety or security whatsoever. Is it not bigger and broader? How worse it, it can get? So if you see, if you hear the stories of frauds five, six, seven years ago, you would perhaps hear of $100 million, $200 million. But now we hear multi-billion dollars of frauds committed over a number of years and no one got to know? That is very surprising. You will say, hello, okay, this is an Indian example. Could you give some other examples? I will give you an international example. Let's take an example of Goldman Sachs, perhaps the best known investment banker in the world. In fact, I was never been a banker, but I was always when in my early days, I, was to, I used to dream that if I would have gone to the banking job, I would have loved to work for Goldman Sachs. And then I realized that Goldman Sachs in 2009, 2010, by the Malaysian government was asked to raise for the government for social welfare fund, $6 billion, $6 billion. And Goldman Sachs was said that if you raise the $6 billion for our country, for the welfare projects, we will give you $600 million as, as, as fees, what 10% fees. $600 million for a $6 billion is a hefty fee, which is a very comfortable. Now, what did uh, uh, Goldman Sachs do? You'll be surprised to know that when they raised the $6 billion, they siphoned up $2.5 billion. Siphoned up $2.5 billion. When the fee itself is $600 million. Now, is it and they did it in 2012, 2013. Now, is it not bold? Is it not huge, broad? 
Is it not bigger? Now, if companies and banks like that does it, I think it is disaster has struck the mankind. And in due course of time, in 2020, Goldman Sachs did a settlement by paying $3 billion. Now, did they agree to the fraud? Did they not agree to the fraud? I'm not getting into it. The fact that there was a $3 billion settlement, I'm sure there was some problem. So in short, when you now hear the case of business crimes, you, you would possibly hear things are much, much deeper, bigger, and broader. It's almost like corruption is taken as stable state, that you're expanding into a region and you need to be corrupt. And, and obviously frauds, like you said, are taking different shapes and forms, right? This is a show about how finance professionals need to be cognizant of such things too. Uh, and how an ethical finance professional or a CA should be aware of these financial frauds. But for me, uh, Robin, what is the incentive for them to be ethical, number one? What is the incentive to go report or whistleblow on such things, right? What is the mechanism that we have to build? Because you are a very strong, you know, um, you have strong views on democracy. You said democracy needs to have these things, right? So I wanted your thoughts as a finance professional and what is the incentive for these things? If a business is lost, if a business has to last a long period, ethics is the superstructure on, business, on which businesses last. If you look at companies which have lasted more than 100 years, let's say Walmart, for example, Shalimar Pets in India, for example, Times of India, for example, you can go on and on, Tata's, for example, you can go on and on, you will find that normally these businesses have been built on ethics. There could be some plunder blunders here and there, plundering, that's fine. But broadly, they would have done under good governance principles. Now, who should get it right? Management should get it right. But if they're themselves involved in hanky-panky, then how will, why should they get, get it right? The second best bet is the finance community. They must get it right. And why they should get it right? Because finance is protecting the assets of an organization. That's what a CFO is supposed to do. That's what a CFO team is supposed to do. Now, even that layer fails. The third layer, perhaps, is the whistleblowers. Some employee, most of the time, it's an employee who is an insider, who figures out another employee is doing some hanky-panky, but I'm not getting a due share. So let me blow a damn whistle and thing might just go out. So normally you will find a whistleblower is an insider. There have been cases where a customer also whistleblew, but there are very less instances of that. So in essence that if an organization has to live for long, which is the purpose of everybody, including you and me, we all want to live long. We don't want to live short and organizations of course wants to live long. Therefore the first layer of defense to my mind is management, which is the board and the senior management. They must set things right. If that fails, then the finance team must set it right. If that fails, perhaps the whistleblower should set it right. When everything fails, perhaps the government sets it right. When they do an investigation or when the income tax returns are filed, they figure out that the income tax returns are falsified. Or when the balance sheet and profit versus account are signed by a charter account, they might find that things may not, may not be right. Also, the auditing community, for instance, can also set things right. There are those four or five layers. So having said that, the most popular method of finding and setting it right is whistleblowers, for sure. Finance team, no question. And to my mind, the primary responsibility lies with the management team who must set right of ethical governance in the organization. Robin, that's really well said. You, I remember back in 2008-9, uh, we had voted Satyam as one of the leading companies. And we had voted uh, the founder as, uh, the, you know, as the business person of the year. And two months later, the fraud hit, and uh, we all know what happened on that. after that, uh, why do why do people with such wealth? It seems as the people who make more money seem to be getting into this habit of trying to cover up things rather than setting things straight. Uh, is that is that a social disease? Would you say uh, that's not going to go away? First of all, to answer your last one, it's not going to go away. That's for sure. 
This disease is a virus. <clears throat> it's worse than a bacteria. It's like Corona 19, uh, COVID-19 is a virus, not a, not, not, a, not a bacteria. But having said that, there are two broad reasons why people who are wealthy continues to do things to get more wealth. Two broad things. There are various other reasons. One is the greed. The sheer greed of getting more money, more power, more name, more fame. And the second is the matter of comparison with someone else. When an entrepreneur finds out that my friend, who we started a business together, and he is appearing or she is appearing on the business covers and televisions more often than I do, and I start doing something different, which perhaps are frauds, so that I get to do televisions more often than my peer or my friend does. So it is a sense of comparison which makes people do things which are wrong. And the third one, perhaps at that level, is opportunity. What did Satya, Mr. Ramalinga Raju, figure out? He figured out, first of all, he got the golden. Peacock Award of Good Governance in the year before he actually came out to the world that I had committed fraud. And he has been committing the fraud for six years. So when he got the Golden Peacock Award, he was also already a fraudster. And he, got the, he took the Golden Peacock Award of Good Governance of the country, number one prize of the country without telling him. So what did he find out? He find, found, figured out that it is easy to do something. The ease of doing something hanky-panky also leads people to do something wrong. What did Mr. Ramalingaraju do? He had perhaps about 50 crores in cash. He showed that cash balance is 5,000 crores. What's the value of zero? It's a question of where you put the zero, after or before. And he put two zeros after the cash balance and then rest is history. So greed, surely, two comparison to beat someone else and three perhaps opportunities. These are definitely the three reasons why things go wrong for many of us. It's interesting, right? Uh, being good at something really doesn't mean that you are an ethical person. That, that it's very interesting in, in your book, in the chapter that you asked me to read, which is very interesting was the art of hiding shady wealth. Even professors, it seems, you know, people who give lectures and are supposed to build students for the future cannot seem to escape from, you know, the enticement of money. You know, it's, it's money laundering is everywhere, right? And uh, and it's interesting to know that even when I look at the Indian banking system, uh, I think in one of the chapters you say it's $19 billion uh, of money lost because they've lent to people without uh, verifying their background. And that's a very staggering number. And we complain of NPAs in this country. Yes, yeah, so one of the worst things which can happen is somebody called a willful defaulter. Willful defaulter is someone who has borrowed money from the bank who has the ability to pay back the money, but shall not pay back the money. See, just think about you and me. If you borrow a few hundred thousand dollars, not even hundred thousand, few thousand dollars for buying a car, and you miss one installment, the banking system will hound you. You miss three installments, the, the bank will take away the car. I mean, poor one, and my car is gone, the bank takes away because I couldn't pay my installments. What happens to these rich guys who doesn't pay thousands of crores having the ability to repay? Their names are available. You and me know those names. Data is available, but still the money is not repaid. But many of us will think, what if the bank money is not paid? What is bank's money? Bank money is your and my money. You and me give money to the bank so that that money is then lent to entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs then return it with interest and you then get your return interest and your principal back. So this value chain must get completed. In the, in, in the meantime, or in the middle, if the entrepreneur runs away with the money, that entrepreneurs run away with your and my money. And more importantly, they're willful defaulters. Defaulters who has the ability to pay, their lifestyle hasn't been sacrificed, they're having a gala good time and many of them on the televisions almost almost every day. And yet, and yet, the society basks at the glory of them and does nothing. This is an atrocious, unfortunate problem is, this is also becoming bigger, broader, bolder. It's almost like a question of leadership. What we've seen right now is if 
the leadership is corrupt, I think the entire chain follows. Uh, that's a very valid point you've raised. And now we have something called cybercrime. Uh, I think in the book you mentioned that every year we lose about $450 billion to cybercrime. Right? So how should a CFO or a finance professional look at this? What are some of the things they can do to equip themselves to understand these kind of uh, crimes? And obviously, nobody is a superman here. How could they collaborate with lawyers better? How could they collaborate with technologists better uh, to stop this? I believe the world is facing two biggest risks. Biggest risks, two biggest risks. One, topic of our discussion. Second is not. One is a cyber crime. No system in the world is unhackable. It is a, it is a bad thing to hear, but that's the fact. The second, which the world might be hit and badly, is lack of drinking water. The second one is not our topic of discussion. In fact, the third world war, if at all, if it happens, it will be the drinking water, which might create the trouble. But now let's come to the first one, which is a cyber crime. As you rightly mentioned, half a trillion dollar of wealth is lost due to cyber crime. Half a trillion dollar. You wake up early in the morning, and I hope I'm wrong. I wake up early in the morning and only find that bank account is empty. Because my bank account is not under my control. It is somewhere sitting in the cloud and it's empty, gone, over. It is not unthinkable. Many, many friends, I'm quite sure you have, you have heard instances amongst your friends who, have, who may have some money in their bank account and overnight they found it's gone. Now, as far as CFOs and finance communities are concerned, it is important that the cyber crime issue, which is very serious because everything is hackable to attack it and get it controlled. This has two aspects, internal and external. Internal controls, external controls. Internal controls are that the internal emails are hacked Internal, somebody poses for someone else. Internally, some, some wrong takes place. Data, data gets compromised. Internally, my formula, formula of the company gets released and so on and so forth. So there are internal controls, which basically means that I will have to have those systems and processes in place that are internally, whatever is available, are protected through multi-firewall systems and state-of-the-art systems. Problem here is most boards do not appreciate, and I'm telling you again, most boards all over the world do not appreciate the risk of cyber crimes hitting internal data, internal issues. Coming to external. Externally, the relationship of a company is with a customer. And when the customer pays, let's say you are buying a book from Amazon, you are more or less sure that if I pay 500 rupees or let's say $10 for a book, normally Amazon is going to get the money and I will get the book. But if you have any doubt, or if you had one instance where you paid $10 and $10 was hyped up, you didn't know where to go, next time you're not going to pay the second $10 for an Amazon book. So Amazon loses a customer. It is important for the finance team to ensure that when a customer interacts with you in your website to make some transactions that her rights and, are, and her money is completely protected. So as the finance team, many a time we think of internal controls, but believe in me, it is very important to protect the customer or the external controls because it has been proven through various research that if a customer is unsure of the website they are visiting, in two thirds of the cases, two thirds of the customer cases, customer will never ever visit one more time. They will just ignore the site website forever. And 80% of the cases, the customer will never give a, a credit or a debit card. So you've lost a customer. Therefore, internal and external, both have to be tackled by the finance or the CFO team to get rid of this whole virus for cyber So they have to work with technologists closer. I'm sure they have to spend time with their service providers. Uh, for a large corporate, it'll be the large IT service companies. If it's a smaller SMB, work with the startups closely. And you're saying don't ignore this, right? You're saying collaborate with lawyers. Go on. 
Pardon there are two on. things I would like to add here when you are talking about uh, technology. Uh, two more steps the CFOs or the finance team needs to take. One is that never compromise on the quality of technology you're adopting. Many a times what happens in order, in order to save cost, we get into systems and processes which are either old or which is, which is there for a long time and we have not upgraded ourselves. And more and more newer technology always brings into some controls with it. And more importantly, do not, do not ever forget to take a cyber crime insurance, cyber insurance. Cyber crime or cyber losses are now insurable losses. It was not available in the past. Today, you can cover a lot of, lot of things, including the lawyer fees, the forensic audit fees, if you have to pay some compensation to a hacker and so on and so forth. And if I may add the third one, the third one, many companies have got a lot of benefit by employing, by employing ethical hackers. Hacker is a hacker who's unethical. Now they're ethical hackers. So ethical hacker is another way to look at, are there any loopholes which our system has so that no one can hack in? So modernize your system, get some ethical hackers if required, which I presume you should, and three, cyber insurer, cyber crime insurance, take that cyber crime insurance, even if it's a little expensive, it's worth it. You know, I was often wondering why the financial cyber crimes are more in Europe and America uh, when compared to India, it's, it's relatively still in a smaller scale. I think it is as much in India as anywhere else. Okay. Except for the one that one dollar is equal to seventy five rupees, <laughs> so so maybe there's seventy five times we see the Indian rupee, and then then maybe we are we are multiplying that way, but most of this hacking originates from the Russian subcontinent, that place, yeah. Russia, Korea, North Korea, uh, Kazakhstan. These are known to be places where hacking or cybercrime is emanating. India is soon coming catching up. Uh, Vishal, I think India is very much catching up. I understand there are towns in, I wouldn't like to mention the state, but in the eastern part of the country, where towns are coming up, where there are hundreds and hundreds of hackers who are just now building themselves up and doing all these um, crimes. So I think it is as much as in India, perhaps it is not getting reported. And even if it gets reported, it goes to the police, and once you go to the police, nobody then wants to go to the public domain saying, I have lost so much money. So I presume that's where it is. But I think this, this virus, as I say, is now all yeah. over the world. So I want to bring this question in, right? It's on ethics and technology. There's Web 3.0. We all know that's what, and blockchain is going to be powering it. We talk about Bitcoin, we talk about crypto. You know, so what should finance professionals keep in mind when it comes to these forms of technologies? Uh, do you think these will be disruptive? and obviously protect, edge the companies against risks. Uh, so do you see this as a clear, clear, uh, you know, future trend that's going to, that is here to stay? Blockchain is a technology, which is the future. The next 10 to 15 years, or maybe two decades is a future. Cryptocurrency is a subset of blockchain. Correct. And so-called Bitcoin is another subset of cryptocurrency. Blockchain is, there are a lot of noises which has been made around blockchain, but it has not yet been commercialized. What is blockchain? Blockchain is all about creating records, maintaining records of a transaction amongst 10 or 12 separate bodies of debits and credits. Let us say Robin sells something to Vishal and there are 12 different people enters a transaction that Robin sold $100 worth of goods to Vishal. And if all these 12 people says, yes, we shall bought $100 worth from Robin, then it must be correct. Based on this basic concept, blockchain gets built up. It is self-auditing online system of recording transactions. Now, this concept looks very simple, but to build businesses on blockchain is yet not fully commercialized. However, some brainy people, took advantage of this concept and built or invented something called cryptocurrency. They say cryptocurrency is a currency. It's a virtual currency. To my mind, it is not a currency. What is a currency? Currency is something which has store, store of value. 
Can you store crypto in your wallet? Answer is no. Then currency is something which is acceptable by someone. If you have a cryptocurrency, one cryptocurrency, can you buy a, go to the Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee? Starbucks will say, I do not understand this cryptocurrency. Chances are 99.9% the shop will reject the cryptocurrency. And the most importantly, if the value fluctuates, because if you have a dollar or a rupee in your pocket, it should have a static value. But today it is $60,000 Bitcoin, tomorrow is $40,000 Bitcoin. What is the value we're having? And if you go to the internet, you will see they are predicting $100,000 Bitcoin value. Why not 100? Why not $200,000 Bitcoin? Now the Who decides is, those things? That's a, that's a question I've asked so many people. What is the underlying value of this, these currencies? This is exactly what I'm coming to. Cryptocurrency, or for the matter, these so-called Bitcoins are speculative in nature. Any value, first of all, it is not a currency I explained to you. It is not a currency. It is not a store of value. You cannot have a cryptocurrency and drink a um, um, Starbucks in any restaurant. That's not possible. Perhaps, I don't know whether it will be possible like 20 years, but it's not possible today. Having said that, cryptocurrency has a value. You can buy and sell for a value. How do you determine a value? Value is determined by demand and supply. If the demand and supply interjects, that's the, that is the place at which the price is determined. What is the demand of cryptocurrency? Who knows? Does we shall know what's the demand? Let us assume for a moment you buy one Bitcoin today worth $42,000. Just because there is a price, you buy it. But where is the demand? Who is buying it? We don't know. Second, who is supplying it? There are 10,000 cryptocurrencies today in the world, 10,000. Now, who is, who is coming out with what cryptocurrency? We don't know. So there is no data on demand. You have never heard, I have never seen. No, there is no, no data yeah. on uh, supply. You have never heard, I have never heard. There is no demand, no supply, but the price exists. Because the price exists, because there is a speculation going on. And, and, why do you need a cryptocurrency? If there is rupee available, dollar available, euro available, yen available, you need it or somebody needs it because I want to buy some drugs. I want to buy an armament. I want to do some hanky banky. And therefore, the majority of the requirement of a crypto is to deal with the underworld or illegal stuffs. The primary thing is the demand comes from illegal stuff. And the secondary is all speculation. There is no demand, no supply. Therefore, Blockchain as a technology is wonderful. That will get developed as time goes by. But the subset called cryptocurrency, which is completely, in my view, is a fraud. It definitely, as it stands today, without the government intervention, rules and regulation, as it stands today, I am definitely saying with open eyes and open ears that it's a fraud. And please do not touch it. As long as it's possible, don't touch it. And it has no science. The price of any crypto or data, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, has no science or logic behind it. Blockchain is good. Cryptocurrency, perhaps as a concept, is good for a store of value in the future, provided it is regulated. But as it stands today, stay away. I think it is a lot of fraud, a lot of humbug which is going on there. Okay. This is an interesting segue for me here. Why do a lot of the world leaders champion it? Why are world leaders doing this? Why is everybody leading people to a herd? Even in India, the RBI has been 50-50 on the subject yet, uh, not yet out with clear regulation. If you talk about India, the Reserve Bank of India very clearly said it needs to be regulated. Very clear, Reserve Bank of India is saying it is not a currency and they have very clearly said it is illegal. However, <clears throat> in India as it stands today, it is not illegal, but it is not legal, which means that if I'm holding cryptocurrency in my computer, I will not be arrested. But if I buy a $1 worth of cryptocurrency, and if I'm not delivered with the cryptocurrency, I can't go to the court and implement my rights. The problem here is the world over, the, politi the political power of politicians are not able to come to a conclusion as to how to control this virtual currency. It is all in the computers, it's all in the virtual world. There are trillions of dollars already which has been invested in this. Now, as soon as you clamp on it, few trillion dollars of wealth will go away. I just imagine there could be actually be riots on the streets. 
These all youngsters who have invested in money on this, they are not going to leave it, saying that my money is gone and the country is getting clamped on. So the, the, the matter of explosion, it has just exploded in the last two years. Before they realized, trillions of dollars have gone and got invested already. So I think we have to bring method into the madness. So first step perhaps is to levy taxes on that. In India, if you are saying, we should levy GST on it, which now needs to have a clarity. And whenever you make profit, you pay income tax on it. The moment you start paying GST, the, G the currency becomes auditable. Who is buying, who is selling? Moment you pay tax, again, it becomes auditable. So let it be a wealth, form of wealth, but start paying taxes. Then you know from where this crypto has come in and perhaps know where the crypto was utilized. So method in the madness has to come in. And more importantly, the whole world has to come with one definition, which is getting difficult as of now. What has China done? China has banned it. China has just banned it. Like, I don't care, it's banned. And over. Now, uh, what has Ecuador done? It's all legal. Everybody can have uh, cryptocurrency. So there is one spectrum who has politicians, Ecuador, cloud, China, who has just said everything no. is bad. And countries like US, UK, India, sitting in the middle, trying to vacillate as to what is to be done. If it is taxed, both VAT or GST as the case may be, and income tax, again, as the case may be, I think we have brought method the madness which I believe will happen sooner than later. I want to get to good governance now. I cannot uh, you know, let you go without talking about good governance. I think you were right when you said good governance in India is used as a euphem euphemism. And we still have a long way to go to actually understand what good governance means. We have well-defined rules for it, of course. You know, One way to start with good governance is to have an independent board of directors. And that you've said in your book and many people have been saying it, but you go on to add, saying in India, the powerful pick their indi the, the independent directors that they want, right? And therefore, it's really truly not independent. Right now, we're in the era of startups. Startups, are, we have more than 70 unicorns now. I'm sure we're getting to 200 uh, very soon. Uh, a lot of money is being raised. A lot of founders have become rich. A lot of employees have become rich in the process also. But one thing waits the subject, right? What are these guys doing when it comes to governance? I don't see any reporting. For example, recently, uh, Unicorn's founder was found a fraud in the previous company that he was in, but it was not reported when he started up this company and raised money. Nobody raised the point. It seems the world had forgotten because there was so much money to be made. Uh, I can't name the startup, of course, but your thoughts on this? So I will focus on startup and good governance first. And I think that's your underlying question. <clears throat> Unfortunately, today there are more investors chasing lesser number of good startups or so-called good ideas. As long as it is happening that there is more demand than supply, the supply of good startups or good idea startups are lesser than the demand. There is euphoria over investors trying to invest into so-called good idea startups. Therefore, startups are getting overvalued. There is no question about it that the startups are overvalued almost two thirds of the cases. We can go on and on. What is the valuation? Where does one feel the valuation is overvalued? We will not get to it. Now, this overvaluation leads to the second. The startups are youngsters. The businesses are three to four years old, five years old. And suddenly they see that their business is worth a billion dollar. They wouldn't even knew, they perhaps didn't know that billion dollar needs how much rupee and what is the number of zeros it has. And their organizations now work a few billion dollars. So overnight, it's a question of racks to reach stories too fast. And therefore, to my mind, they lose their mind. Many of us lose, their, lose our mind to suddenly success itself. If gradually a businessman or an entrepreneur becomes successful, they, it sinks into it. Suddenly a success happens, it doesn't sink at all. You will see many an Olympic champion who wins the Olympic medal in age, age of 18, 19, they would have burnt out at 23, 24 because success hits them, the lack practice, and then the next Olympic, they don't, they, they don't win at all. Very, very few. Youngster has continued to do well. Very, very few, not even 
This is what is happening to startups. And the third important issue is startups are not public companies. Therefore, their accounts are not audited. There is no chartered accountant who is audited and you and we don't get to know that audited accounts. Therefore, many a times, many a times the startup accounts are fudged. So if I can somehow show that my sales is $1 million, I can then raise $20 million of funds. I just have somehow show $1 million, although it may not be even $100,000. And that's the problem. Point is, suddenly they become rich. Some few have good ideas. Success is hitting many. And the accounts are not audited because they're not public companies. So this, this mixture of um, negativities, if I may say, is an ideal combination for a potential fraud. And please don't be surprised that many of the startups who are now blue eyes and green eyes and yellow eyes in front of everyone will blow up sooner than later. And so all your investors, all the ones who are going to listen to the story, please be careful that all that what you see is not gold. We forget to do due diligence on most of the startups, uh, especially when it's coming from somebody uh, who can make us big money or who has a history of making money in the past. We seem to think that some, let somebody else figure out uh, due diligence later on. Uh, I think in hindsight, I think we aren't doing a very, fairly good job of this, if that's, if that's what I can surmise. It's, it's, firstly, there aren't there checks and balances that somebody has to do on a person? Just like, you know, you know, some, you know, all these cab ride ailing apps, they have to do due diligence on the driver that they're going to employ in their app, right? They have to do the same with the startup, I'm sure, or the founder, if he's, uh, an, if he's been around in the industry for a while, if it's his second or third startup. But, you know, it's, it's for me over the last few weeks, what has come to light is some of the founders are really not genuine, but nothing seems to come out upon them. I mean, is, is, it, is the industry protecting them? I feel a bit weird that, uh, that you know, they seem to be getting, getting out scot-free, especially the startup world, because it seems to be the darling of uh, the Indian political narrative at this point of time. We also have a national startup state. how the investors are looking at is different from how you and me should look at. An investor looks at picking up 10 startups, knowing fully well all 10 startups will not do well. Even if two or three does well, they would have made enough money for the losses they would have incurred in the balance seven. And therefore, there is a matter of speculation and matter of taking a view on the, on the part of the investors when they choose the 10 startups. Just because investors have picked up 10 startups does not necessarily mean that all due financial diligence have happened and everything is hunky-dory. Does not necessarily mean. Because the investors look at it differently because they will enter and they will exit at a time when you wouldn't even a normal investor or a retail investor wouldn't even know when that exit is taking place without telling you anything. Therefore, the startup ecosystem is fantastic for the country, for the world, for sure. Good ideas must get money, but it is the black sheep amongst them. Most of them are fine. It is a black sheep amongst them, which is the problem. You and me cannot figure out who that is. Therefore, I would believe that if you are a retail investor, keep about not more than 10 to 15% of your wealth allocation towards startup investments. I wouldn't, uh, I would advise that invest 50% of your wealth in startups. No, not at this moment. Invest in the startups after a few years of they have become public company, after you have seen how they perform, and after you have seen their results are coming out. There will never be too late for you to invest. There will always be an opportunity for investing in good options. Never ever a good option goes away. It is always a, 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 a trajectory upstairs. However, if it's a bad investment, the trajectory is down, you would have avoided a loss. Therefore, don't be in a hurry. Don't invest more than 10 to 15% of your wealth and invest in the startups once they become public. And after two to three years, when you see their financial numbers and you have got more, let's say, credibility around the startup entrepreneur because the fulcrum on which a startup works are the owners, the co-owners. At the fulcrum is good, chances are that it would continue to do well. 
Fair point, sir. I think I agree with you. I agree, agree with you on most of this. I, those of you watching this must check out uh, Robin's new book. It's called Corporate Frauds, Business Crimes Now, Bigger, Broader, Should and I show Bolder. The book? This is how the I'm going to show it to them. Yeah, oh, I have it. <laughs> Let's show it together. Right. So now I want to ask you, what is going to be bigger, broader, and bolder for 2022? Your predictions for 2022. I will, I will break this question. What do I expect for 2022? I will break the questions into two parts because you, we are discussing corporate frauds. So my prediction for 2022 corporate frauds is it will become bigger, broader, bolder again. So please don't be surprised at 2022 you find things are getting out of hand just because there are more prisons becoming, getting, getting made or just because more entrepreneurs are being jailed. It is not going to end. It is becoming worse. As regards non-fraud, which is economic the bit of it, I will get into two parts, India and others. I'm very bullish on India, extremely bullish on India. I personally believe that we would see uh, a new powerful India. Um, India will definitely emerge as one of the strongest performing country in the world for all that we may criticize the government, the democracy, the people, the education and everything, ecosystem, but still, it is, to my mind, the best place of doing business. Rest of the world will also do quite well because last two years, because of the pandemic, there have been a lot of pent up demand. People haven't traveled, people haven't consumed, people haven't bought. So all that, once this pandemic comes to a closure, it will not close close. We will have to live with some COVID in any case, as we have been told by doctors, that some virus will be there and just treat it as a flu and it's okay. We'll live on with it, maybe three to four months down the line. So this pent up demand is going to be, do, will, will help us in making consumption in 2022. So the world will do well, the tourism sector will do well, the hotel will do well, the infrastructure, the real estate sectors, the pharmaceutical sector, the chemical sector, steel, power, they are all going to do reasonably well. India, to my mind, will do better in all these because large population, per capita income is growing, there is pent up demand, there is desire to perform better. And of course, we are, depends upon which way you see, we're the third largest uh, GDP country in the world, at least on PPP power. So uh, I'm bullish on India, fairly bullish on the world, but unfortunately we might see bigger, broader, bolder fraud in 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, Mr. Robin Banerjee, uh, the author and he is, the author of the book, Corporate Frauds, Business Crimes Now, Bigger, Broader, and Bolder. Thank you so much, Robin, for being on this uh, session. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching Finance Beyond 2022, powered by Capita. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, all of you. Thank you, Vishal.